Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm really, really proud and honored to be here. So I, if you look at to the north part of the state, that's where I'm from. I was born in Reston, Louisiana, but I currently live in New Orleans. The BP Gulf disaster is not just spilling crude into a natural environment, it's also polluting a social and cultural environment as well. Now, the oil and gas industry has made an enormous difference in the state of Louisiana. It changed my state from a mostly agrarian economy to a full-fledged industrial powerhouse. And many coastal communities that traditionally relied on fishing became dependent on the industry for jobs, basic services, and a tax base. And the oil and gas extraction and drilling support services provide 320,000 jobs in Louisiana which may help to explain the strange combining of shrimp and petroleum into one celebration. <laughs> now, this used to be just the shrimp festival in the 20s. It was a, a blessing of the fleet where special prayers were said over the boats in order to make sure that they brought back a healthy harvest. But petroleum was annexed into the title in the 1960s, and in spite of the name change, the state allowed it to retain its seniority as the oldest state chartered harvest festival. I don't know what this festival is going to look like this year. But honestly, and I, I won't be surprised, and I hope you won't either, if there's a strong showing of support and solidarity on the coast, that the, the communities there have a fierce loyalty to the petroleum industry, and that should not be underestimated. Of course, Louisiana's relationship with the oil and gas industry is not all cozy. The industry has left us with a toxic legacy and a loss of environmental integrity. We lose, or we have lost, 1,900 square miles of coastal wetlands, which is about the size of Rhode Island. And this is a map of Louisiana. Everyone thinks that this looks like Louisiana, right? 19, but this is a map from 1932. This is a more accurate representation. This was taken in 2005. And we lose a football field of wetlands every 45 minutes. Notice the straight lines. Nature doesn't work in straight lines. This is a canal dug through the marshland by the oil industry, and that has allowed salt to intrude into sensitive areas and kill plants. And this is a, a navigation canal in 1970, and here it is again in 2001. That's how quickly marshlands can be destroyed with salt water. But the extraction industry is also incredibly dangerous. And when this happened, it was weirdly familiar to me personally. So going back, when I was 17, my father and I were living in Thailand, Bangkok, Thailand. He was a petroleum engineer, and his job was to drill faster and deeper than anyone else. And he actually won an award for this. He um, held the drilling record in the Gulf of Siam in 1989. And the company actually threw a pretty big party for him for that. And he would leave for work on Thursdays, and he would return the following Thursday. And I was left to my own devices. Um, but he trusted me, and I valued that trust, even at 17, um, <laughs> which helped me stay out of trouble. And in a town like Bangkok, that that town offers ample opportunity for trouble, let me tell you. Um, so in November of my senior year, he left to join the crew on the drill ship Seacrest. The next day, Friday, I got a call from the company telling me that there was a problem. They had lost communication with the ship. And the next day, Saturday, uh, we learned that the ship had capsized in a storm. They didn't know if anyone on board had made it. They sent out search crews, and for three days, much like the 11 families of the men who died on the BP Horizon disaster, I waited and hoped and prayed that he would be found alive. But the reality is he never should have been out there in the first place. There was a typhoon developing, Typhoon Gay. And I don't, normally when there's potential for severe weather, drilling is suspended. And so I, I don't know why they let them go to work that day um, and I never will know why. Um, all, I, all I do know, because the details are very sketchy, is that 91 out of the 97 men aboard perished, and the, one of the six survivors reported um, that the anchor 
wouldn't release. It wouldn't come up and it wouldn't let go. And they were having a lot of trouble with it. The waves were 10 stories high and it was throwing the ship around wildly. And many of the crew decided that they'd rather take their chances in the ocean than stay on the ship. And right before one survivor jumped overboard, the last thing he saw was my father with an ax trying to hack through that anchor. Um, and as far as I know, he was the last person to see my father alive. This is him hiking in Colorado. <laughs> um, so when I was 17, I lost someone, the most important person to me. And I felt really alone. But the truth is, I'm not alone. Many families have been torn apart by the inherently dangerous work of extraction and mining. And I've wondered, how can we stop making human sacrifices for a tank of gas? Most of our regulatory agencies function under the principle that whatever you're doing is okay until it's proven otherwise. So cutting down a tree or selling a product, that's considered safe until evidence surfaces that it's not. The precautionary principle, on the other hand, says that we should make sure an activity is safe before we engage in it. So I've been told to use a technique to try to explain my concept, so I'm going to use the compare and contrast method. So this is a person putting on gloves, demonstrating the precautionary principle. They don't know if the person they're treating has a blood-borne disease, where the risk of contracting that disease is low, but the consequences of contracting that disease are severe. Versus these people, I would call these people that they're using the throw caution to the wind principle. First of all, sunbathing. I don't know if the fair-haired, skinned, fair-skinned people out there uh, identify with me, but oh yeah, there's an impending oil slick coming onto shore. Um, I think the throw caution to the wind principle is also demonstrated quite well here. <laughs> the Food and Drug Administration. They require that a drug is safe before it's released into the marketplace. And this is not an easy process. It takes a long time, and it's expensive. It requires a large research and development budgets, and yet pharmaceuticals are not hurting for profits. The Environmental Protection Agency, on the other hand, they only test a chemical if it has shown to be dangerous. And they have only required testing of less than 1% of the 80,000 chemicals registered in the US since 1976. The precautionary principle demands that a company prove that their product is safe before it's released into the marketplace. This is an acoustic blowout preventer. This costs $500,000. This is an emergency drilling rig for a relief well. This costs about $500,000 a day. Now, skimming the oil is the best way to remove oil before it gets into sensitive marsh areas when there's really no good way to get it out after that. The throw, wind to the or, uh, throw caution to the wind principle has allowed a million and a half gallons of the dispersant corrects it to be released into the Gulf. And that does not, dis dispersant does not get rid of the oil, it just hides the oil. And we have no idea what this dispersant is gonna do in the long term. The EPA has never required any long-term studies or performed these studies, even though this product has been on the market for many years. The precautionary principle means thinking about what dangers are probable and acting accordingly, not just ignoring the risks and suffering the consequences. <laughs> when I was 17, I lost the most important person to me, but losing my father to the industry gave me perspective, it gave me resolve, and I hope that sharing my story with you today will give you perspective and resolve, because it is wholly up to us to change our lens 
It's our paradigm that's the problem. And we cannot expect companies that make catastrophic mistakes to learn from those mistakes when it's the system that allowed that mistake to happen. And those companies still profit under the system. It's time for us to force our government to think outside the barrel. And nothing less than our future is at stake. Thank you. <laughs>